Blender 5.0 just dropped and here's three of my favorite changes. Number one, adaptive subdivision. What it does is that when you add a subdivision modifier to an object, instead of adding subdivisions uniformly across the object, the subdivision and poly density depends on the position from the camera. Mesh closer to the camera will have more subdivisions and mesh further away will have less. This ends up saving you a ton of resources. To get started, set the render engine to cycles, as adaptive subdivision is currently a cycles only feature. Set up a material on your object, making sure it also has a displacement map plugged in. In the modifier tab, add a subdivision modifier and bump up the number of subdivisions. In the material tab, open the settings panel and set the displacement type to displacement and bump. Then using the displacement node in the shader editor, you can control how much displacement occurs and see the effect in real time. At the moment, the displacement is happening uniformly across our mesh. When looking up from the camera view, the parts further away don't need as much detail as the parts closer up. So back in the modifier tab, enable adaptive subdivision. Using this, we can instantly see the difference in the level of detail closer to the camera. The pixel size refers to the level of detail. The higher the pixel size, the lower the amount of detail. The lower the pixel size, the higher the amount of detail. The viewport and render label here refer to the amount of detail that'll be displayed in each one. So if the pixel size is 1, that's what it'll render as. But in the viewport, the pixel size will be 8 in order to smooth in the performance of your scene. If you wanted to have the viewport and render level detail be the same so you can see it in real time, head to the render settings and open the subdivision tab. Then simply set the dicing rate render and viewport to 1. Now, back in the modifier tab, you can see that both values are the same, meaning what you see in the viewport is what you'll see in the render. Best practice is to usually leave a bit of discrepancy between the viewport and render detail levels, so I set my viewport level to 4. By using the fly mode in camera view and placing our camera, we can see the level of detail updating because we've moved the camera closer to that part of the mesh. Looking at the wireframe of the mesh, we can see that as it gets further away from the camera, the polygons are increasing in size and hence decreasing the detail. Number 2. Object Modifier With the release of Blender 5.0, a couple of new super useful modifiers have been added. The first you may have noticed is the Array Modifier. We now have a new Array Modifier and a Legacy Array Modifier. Let's take a look at the new Array Modifier which is now powered by Geometry Nodes. The count and offset still works in the same way as the original, but now we've got the option to instantly adjust the rotation and scale of the arrayed objects. You can see by adjusting the rotation that each array object in the sequence is rotated slightly more than the last. That's because it's applying the rotation value based on the previous object. So if we set the rotation value to 180 degrees, it's going to flip 180 degrees on that axis for each new object in the array. Similarly, we can adjust the scale and we can see that each object is getting bigger or smaller from the previous object in the array as it's taking the previous object's transform value as reference. We also have new ways in which the array is structured using these shape values at the top. By setting it to circle, I'm sure you can guess what it does, it creates a circular array. To adjust it, make sure you have this gizmo icon enabled at the top and then simply grab this handle and drag it in or out to adjust the radius. This feature genuinely makes me want to cry tears of joy. The old way of doing this is using the curve modifier, and circle curve was super janky and annoying. In the settings, there's also a couple of different options to play with. Changing the count method to distance means that the count, or number of objects, is based on the distance between objects. You can see by decreasing the distance, it means more objects can fit into the circle. You can adjust the axis in which the circle is arrayed across, you can set the segment to arc if you want to have an arc of objects rather than a full circle, and then adjust the angle. You can also control the radius of the circle or arc directly in the modifier settings. Using the Align Rotation option, you can choose which axis you want the objects to align to. The Randomize option is also super useful. You can randomize the transform values for each object in the array in order to get the variation you might need. There's also two other shape types we haven't looked at, Curve and Transform. By setting it to curve, you can see our object disappears. That's because we haven't yet created a curve object. To do so, press Ctrl A, go to curve, and add a bezier curve. Then adjust it to the shape you want your array to follow. Back in the modifier settings, set the curve object to the curve you just created. 
you can immediately see the object arrays along the curve, and you can similarly adjust the settings to however you see fit. Finally, there's the transform option, which is probably the most interesting. You can change the count as normal, but then, by adjusting the rotation for example, you can see it started to taper off. Using the gizmo is actually more intuitive for this, and you can come up with some really interesting results using it. By setting the transform reference to object, we can use any object to control the array rather than using specific values. For example, add an empty and set it as the transform target. Now by adjusting the position, size, and rotation of the empty, you can see the array behaving off of that. There's also a few other new modifiers that came with Blender 5.0, such as the geometry input, instance on elements, randomized transform, scatter or surface, and curve to tube modifiers. We'll cover some more of these in another video. With all these new modifiers, you're probably going to end up generating a lot more custom assets as you build scenes. And keeping track of all those meshes, materials, and test objects can get messy fast. That's why I've been using Connector, who are sponsoring this video. Connector is a simple asset manager that keeps all your models, materials, and project files in one clean visual library. It basically removes the need to dig through scattered folders just to find something, and it's completely free. You can preview assets instantly, tag them, filter them, and drag them straight into your scene. It works with cloud storage and shared libraries too, so whether you're on your own or working with other people, everything stays organized and easy to find. Setting it up is simple. Just download Connector from their website, the main app is free. Once it's installed, open the integration tab and pick Blender or whatever you use. Then inside Blender, select any object or material, right click and hit Add as Asset. After that, you can drag those assets back into any Blender project from Connector, linking them, appending them, or just dropping in materials. If you've ever forgotten where you saved something or which version you used last, it saves a lot of time. And since it works with other software like Unreal Engine and 3DS Max 2, it basically becomes a library you can keep using even if your workflow changes later. If you want something simple that makes finding your assets less of a headache, check out Connector using the link in the description. Number 3. Compositor The compositor in Blender 5.0 has gone over a bit of an overhaul. You can see now that we've got the compositing presets available, meaning you can get stuck into the compositing process a lot quicker, and also making it more accessible for beginners. All there is to do is to drag the effect you want into the compositor, hook up the nodes, and adjust the settings to your liking. Similarly, the sensor noise is an awesome effect to be able to plug directly into the compositing. It adds some artificial noise, allowing you to easily create that retro-style look to your scene. There's also a vignette noise, which previously took a few steps of creating a mask, darkening the edges, etc. Now all there is to do is dragging it into your setup and adjusting the settings. There's a couple other useful ones in there also, and I'm sure there will be more of these effects added in future updates. The glare node also had an update, and it now has this sunbeams glare type, which I'm sure you can imagine what it does. It produces sunbeams from the brighter areas of your scene, and you can of course adjust the settings as you see necessary. One of the other preset effects that I did want to quickly mention is the Tune Image node. It's basically like a control panel for some of the most important values in your image, and it allows you to adjust the contrast, color boost, aka saturation, clarity, detail, and sharpen. Super handy for adjusting the parameters from one node. There's a couple other handy changes in the compositor that we can go further in depth on if that's something you guys want to see. That's all for this video. Be sure to subscribe. Enjoy!